based on the lower slopes of your own ignorance and begun to understand the great vistas of non-knowledge that you have that you can claim to have been educated at all. So it ought to be the case that I'm repeatedly confronted with questions like that. In fact, I suppose the one that is most often asked is, um, how can I say I know there's no God? And these are from people who don't understand the ABC of the atheist argument, which is that we don't say and can't prove um, that there's no God, but we will say there's no good evidence and there's never yet been involved a good argument for saying that there is. That's why we're more modest than we perhaps look sometimes. Whereas those who say there is, don't only say there is, because that means they've won an argument, but they say there is in order that they can claim the authority of that God to tell other people what to do. So they make an extraordinary claim with only very ordinary, at best, evidence, sometimes obviously fantastic evidence, fabricated evidence. Um, and they make very, very large claims for themselves. They say, well, now I know what God wants. You have to do what I want. Um, we repudiate that. Um, and we say, no, there are, there are a couple of easier, simpler questions that you haven't answered yet, like the difference between being a deist and a, a theist, for example. So I like to think that um, at least while I'm debating with people of that kind, they're not going to come up with a question that I haven't heard before. But on every other subject, uh, whether it was paleontology, biology, uh, political economy, uh, anthropology, I would expect that there would be an, an infinite number of questions to which I wouldn't even begin to have an answer because I simply wouldn't know. Um, that's really the, the principal difference. If, you, if there's something where there is doubt, don't claim you're certain. Uh, it's amazing how relaxing it is not to pretend to know more than you do. I'm, I'm surprised that those who claim to speak in the name of God don't take more advantage of this relief. So, Ad Leomofa, opaque, says, you've called yourself a Marxist, but you say you no longer consider yourself a socialist. This issue was addressed in a Reason article a while ago. Could you elaborate? For instance, is the power of the unaccountable corporation no longer a major concern for you? You've also been eerily silent on the healthcare debate, as far as I know, why? As far as I know, comma, why? Well, um, in a way, I can't stop uh, myself thinking in the, in the way I was first trained to think, which is as someone who believes in the materialist conception of history, thinks that people act not according to their proclaimed ideals so much as they do according to their interests. In other words, that the Crusades, for example, were not entirely a, a spiritual event, but were to do with unresolved uh, rivalries and contradictions in the material world. Actually, it's almost commonplace now to do this. Almost all historians are Marxists in that sense. They, they don't judge people by their opinions of each of themselves, but by some more objective standard. Um, Marx used to, having understood that capitalism was very revolutionary, and praised it for being so revolutionary and so dynamic, uh, hoped that the working class could learn from capitalism uh, and take over its dynamism, but without its contradictions and without its cruelties. I'd have to say that that didn't work out um, in quite the way that it had been hoped. And then, in fact, capitalism survived a number of its crises and near collapses and has reemerged as still a very dynamic and innovative force. So I, I feel that's a historical defeat for the socialist idea, if not for the Marxist one. I hope that's not too uh, glib a reply. Um, as to whether private corporations can do more damage or are equally dangerously unaccountable as are governments or states or bureaucracies, I, I, I'm willing to split the difference, if you like. I mean, it, it depends really in which country you live, but I certainly think that the, the worst outcome ever achieved was probably in Eastern Europe uh, before the overthrow of communism, where there were all the disadvantages of an unaccountable uh, industrialism, pollution, um, waste, uh, ecological despoliation, uh, secrecy, exploitation, um, 
misery on the assembly line and in the workplace with absolutely none of the advantages of uh, the innovative uh, forces of, of capital. It was a, something that was parasitic on loans from the rest of Europe. So uh, I think it's worth bearing that in mind. And of course, in China at present, you have an absolute collusion between a supposedly all-powerful state, which still officially operates in the, in the name of uh, communist ideology, and a, a very large number of very unaccountable private corporations, both Chinese uh, located, uh, endogenous, if you like, local to China, and multinational corporations that um, want to take advantage of them. So there's no necessary opposition between these two things. You can easily get a synthesis of them, either positive or negative. On the healthcare debate, uh, wake me when it's over. Um, I, I remember Richard Nixon getting us so near to healthcare, or so we all thought, uh, that I've become a little bit cynical about this. I sometimes think healthcare is the default position of politicians who are in, in a corner. Um, the, there seems to be something about the United States, I sometimes think, that sort of doesn't really want healthcare. That even people who could most benefit from it in this country don't want it. Um, I almost think it's psychic sometimes, or psychological, I mean. They, they'd rather live dangerously. They'd rather not live in a country where they were taken care of. I hope this doesn't sound flippant, but I don't expect there ever to be socialized medicine in the United States, if, if that's what you mean. Not even if everybody did want it, which they, I think, don't. Hope that doesn't sound too cynical. Um, Palsh 7 has identified the essence of the question what consensus exists between socialism and libertarianism? Well, he hasn't identified the essence. He's only put the question. How did this creep in? How did this guy make the cut? Just kidding. Um, I suppose, well, at, at least at the beginning um, of each movement, the, the thing in common that the socialist movement had, well, there wasn't a libertarian movement in the early days of the industrial Revolution. You don't really get libertarian movements until there's a certain amount of, of peace, democracy, and prosperity, and where the, the hard task of building a state and creating the nation has been done. So it's a historic question in some ways, but let's say that socialism begins, Marxism certainly begins, by looking forward to the end of the state, uh, to the withering away of the state, as Marx and Engels famously put it, and to as they better put it, actually, to the replacement of the government of men by the administration by men of things. And that bit of the, of the ideal got dropped out in the terrible struggles in, in Europe and elsewhere in the 20th century 